So if you knew that you only had several days left on Earth, what would you do? That was the question that Jesus was facing on this Palm Sunday. How would you spend your time? You know, as I've been sitting in this question for myself, I would likely, I'm sure, like some of you, want to spend it with family. If I could get some place where there was beautiful sunrises and sunsets, that would certainly be a bonus for me. And when we look at how Jesus spent his final days, it brings us to a deeper question. How is it that the Christ walks through even knowing that there was limited time left on the earth? We look at it so that we can understand, so that we can really grasp what a full expression of the Christ looks like through a human body and being. As the choir so beautifully just reminded us this morning, that Palm Sunday was a morning of great celebration and anticipation. The people there believed that the long-awaited Messiah had finally arrived and was entering Jerusalem and being the one to come and usher in a new life for those who had been oppressed for so long. It was the Passover festival. It was one of the great celebrations that everyone from around the surrounding lands came to join. Finally, they believed their long-awaited liberation was at hand. Jesus, according to the scriptures, had a knowing that this week was going to end much differently than those who were welcoming, welcoming him in. And yet, in the midst of all this glorious celebration, even knowing that what they were celebrating wasn't exactly going to be the way things unfolded, he was able to be present. He was able to smile and to wave and to enjoy this moment with the people around him. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could have managed that. And to me, this is one of the best proofs, if you will, examples that Jesus was indeed fully Christed. He was fully embodied by that God awareness alive in him. How could you be joyful when you knew that the people who were lining the roads singing cheers of Hosanna, many of them would be the same people a few days later saying crucify him. When he didn't show up in the way that they expected him to, they were the first ones to say, eh, be rid of him. The only way that I can see being able to do this is to be in the present moment. I've been really pondering, how can you do this? How can we follow that example? Because the Christ is only alive in us in the present moment. I know if you're anything like me, most of us don't spend a whole lot of time in the present moment. Our minds are normally thinking about what has happened or they're off trying to understand and predict and, and see what might be coming in the future. We're either reliving the past or we're anticipating what's to come. And when we interact with others in our lives, we often bring the past into that present moment with them. So we're not just having a conversation unique to that moment. We are having a conversation that is clouded by every other conversation we may have had with them or every other action. Or we're anticipating what that conversation might lead to in the future, anticipating what they might say or do. Jesus demonstrated that at least in part, our journey to fully expressing our own innate divinity, we believe every person 
has that potential within them, our own indwelling Christ is to be in the present moment. Jesus, with his ability to do this, spent his final days in service to the awakening of humanity. If we look at what happened as this week unfolded, everything he did was to continue to the best of his ability to awaken those around him to the possibilities, to teach and to demonstrate that indeed all things were possible. One of the first things that happened is one of the most interesting and debated things. Once he had entered into Jerusalem, he went to the temple and all three synoptic gospels describe him going in to the temple and overturning the tables and chasing the money changers out of that space. Most people depict this action as Jesus was angry. Was a moment of human emotion getting the better of him? A demonstration of God's righteous will, God's righteous wrath? Or was he even angry at all? My belief, and you'll have to come to your own understanding, was that Jesus was acting not with anger but with zeal. And there's a difference. He was being very deliberate and he was using it as a teaching moment. And zeal is not only something that is an important way to, to engage in the outer world, but it's necessary often for the changes in our inner being. Metaphysically, when we look at what this shows up, if we're all the characters, if we're playing all the parts and everything is a reflection of some aspect of us, the money changers in our lives are any place where we have the wrong priorities or we've put our faith in something in the material world rather in our own God kingdom and connection. It may be the money changers are when fear shows up for us and so we think this is what we need in order to be safe or survive. At times, it takes some inner force some energy, some zeal to bring ourselves back to the truth. As Jesus said, this should be a place of prayer, not a place of commerce and exchange and profit. Jesus then goes on to spend his days teaching in the temple. We're told he went every day, reinforcing what he taught, what we just explored as he was on the Sermon on the Mount, telling stories and parables and, and sometimes even speaking very directly about the path, the, the place where we can experience the kingdom of heaven is only through that energy of love. And as many expressions as compassion, as forgiveness, as non-judgment. He continues to heal and demonstrate the healing power when we're in this space. He gets those who could not walk to now move on their own power. He allows the blind to see once again. And even as the time of his arrest was drawing near, he gathers those close to him for one final time for them to connect for one moment for him to be that energy and that catalyst to get them through what he knew was coming. And he starts that evening just as he rode in on a donkey in the space of humility by washing the disciples' feet. Even to their um, disagreement with that, to their unwillingness to say, no, 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 you're so much more than we are. We should be washing your feet. Humility is the other real signpost 
that we are expressing from our own Christ nature. I love Pope Francis and the energy that he has brought back to those in the Catholic faith to remind people we are here to be of service. We are not here to be served, but we are here to serve the people. We are here to walk and demonstrate in the same way that the one that we call our Savior demonstrated for us. And this most revered figure of the Catholic Church continues to demonstrate that. Every year since he has stepped in as Pope, he has gone to the places of the lowliest of people and served them by washing his feet. I wanted to just share a quick video. And just breathe as you watch this act of service. He even kisses the feet of those, and these were prisoners that he had gone. So we're going to have a meditation time, and it was a little bit too challenging logistically to wash feet today, but our care team is here, and they are inviting you to come and have your hands washed in that energy of service, in the energy of love, in the energy of humility. It's optional. In just a moment, the ushers are going to invite you to come up row by row. And if you're willing, I would invite you to come and just feel that sense of being served and know that as you are served, your call is to go out and allow others or, or, and, and to open yourself to serve others. The Christ serves you so that you can go out and serve the world. Just take a deep moment, deep breath with me in this moment, and feel that presence of the indwelling Christ here to serve you so that you may go out and be that presence to the world. Celebrate that this morning. Feel those sense of hosannas within you rising up. And give thanks. Give thanks for the way in which it will, moment by moment, small gesture and act by small gesture and act, bring about heaven here on earth. So those who are awake to the Christ presence within, who are seeking to live from that presence in a greater way, are also called to be in service to the wake awakening of humanity. You know, as we anticipate this resurrection of Easter morning, we are called to follow this same path, this same example that Jesus walked before us. We demonstrate our Christ nature whenever we are seeking to serve those around us. We don't have to wash people's feet 
for an impact to be made. Sometimes it's just a simple offering of a smile, a kind gesture, a willingness to be present and listen to another with compassion. The list goes on and we know and we've experienced many of these. And each time we do, it adds another drop to the awakening for all. And I don't think we can do that unless we're in the present moment. So that's one of the things that we're invited to practice more and more often, is to be in the present moment. And I wanted to end by offering a few suggestions these are from Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup um, for the Soul, yes. And he's done many, many other works out there regarding mindfulness and this kind, compassionate way of being in the world. So he says this. He says, remaining in the present moment is going to require a degree of effort. <laughs> it's going to require some commitment. It will not come naturally, at least not for most people. So start by spending your day, take a few moments at the beginning of each day, reminding yourself that you need to enjoy the day for what it is and make the most of it. I needed some of that this morning. To develop a system for reminding yourself to remain present throughout the day. It could be that you set a reminder. Some people have done this, whether it's hourly or once mid-morning and mid-afternoon and early evening. And when that alarm goes off, that's your cue to breathe and just be present, to be aware of your surroundings. You know, so many of us go through the day and we aren't even, we, it's like we have blinders on to everything that's going around and we're single focused to just what's right in front of us or in the past or future where our minds are at. So set a reminder to pause and to look around, to carefully examine your surroundings and the people in it and think about what's happening outside of just your own singular space. You know, so much of us spend a good part of our day waiting on something. Sometimes we spend a good part of our life waiting on something. If only, and when this happens, then life will be good. And whether it's just that short-term waiting while we're sitting in traffic, or where we're sitting in the doctor's room, or waiting room, or standing in line somewhere to get something, or whether it's long-term, like waiting on a promotion, or waiting for retirement, people spend so much of their time simply waiting. And if you ask them, well, what do you do? And they would probably say, I'm waiting. And at first glance, it might seem that it's inevitable that this is part of our human experience. We've kind of gotten used to, from the time we were young enough to go to daycare or to school, we spent a lot of our time in lines waiting for our turn at something. And it seems like it's almost just a part of our human existence. However, wouldn't it be great if you could remove some of that waiting and in that time allow it to be something that you can be in service by simply being present to those around you? According to Eckhart Tolle, who is the author of, um, oh my God, <laughs> help me, help me. Thank you, The Power of Now. Thank you very much. I've read all of his books. Waiting in a state of mind is a situation that we find ourselves in. No, wait. Waiting is a state of mind more than it is a situation that we find ourselves in, meaning that we can control it. We can direct it. It's not something that we don't have any power to decide how we choose. It's not an event. It's how we choose to be in that. So the next time that you find yourself waiting for something, trying not, try not to think of yourself as waiting at all. Rather, 
When you find yourself in those situations, think of it as an opportunity to enjoy the present moment, to become aware of the surroundings, to look when you're sitting in traffic, look around you, look at the trees, look at the sky, look at and send a blessing to the other people who are sitting there simply waiting around you. Your invitation this week is to start each day with this simple prayer. God, keep me in the moment. Well, it is our opportunity now to share of our financial good. We are grateful for the many ways and the many channels in which we receive our good. Today, the ushers are going to be passing the basket, so you just get to sit back and relax. In fact, we're going to do that next Sunday, too. And just a reminder, this is our first Sunday, and so we um, will also gratefully receive um, anything that you might be willing to share or be able to share for our reserve fund. Um, I'm told that we may possibly have an air conditioner that's going to need to be replaced. So just keep that in your minds and in your prayers and know that we are abundantly blessed to take care of all of that. So let us take what we offer here today or through our committed giving program into our hands and into our hearts and bless it together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, Father, Mother God. As we go into this day, into this week, we hold that prayer to be in the moment as often as possible as we go, knowing our prayer for protection. Together, the light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well.